worthy for those praises. He's worthy for us to lift him up. We know that the Bible says God is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all you can ask or think. Father, we praise you. We know that you are able to do just what you said. Exceedingly abundantly above all you could ask.
great I am. We know you as the provider. We know that the very breath we breathe, Father, Lord, we know it comes from you. The very air in our lungs, Father. You give life. You are love. believe this morning that he's great amen there is none like him 
in all of the world, in all of the earth. And this is a worship service where we come strictly to worship Him and to focus on Him. I want us to do that right now. I want you to just close your eyes. I just want you to begin to thank Him for all of the things that He's done in your life right now. I want you to thank Him for everything He's done for you this week, where He's brought you from, what He's brought you through. I want you to worship Him. He's worthy of our praise. I want us to make this a worship service. Lord, I'm thankful this morning that we're all alive, healthy. None of us are hungry. None of us are starving. Lord, we're not at the funeral home. We're not at the hospital. But we're here in your house, brothers and sisters, worshiping you together. I thank you for being with us through this week. I thank you for keeping your hands upon us. I thank you, Lord, for watching over us. I thank you, Lord, even in the times that we didn't realize you were watching us. Thank you for taking care of us. Thank you for protecting us through the night, day after day. Thank you, Lord, for meeting our needs. Thank you, Lord, for what you've done in us. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you, Lord, for our freedom. Thank you, Lord, for the liberty to worship you. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity that we have here in our country today to come into this place to worship you without going through armed guards, without having to get permits, but just able to gather and worship you all because of you, all because of what you've done for us. We're grateful today. Lord, let our hearts not fail to worship you here this morning. We give you glory. We give you honor. We give you praise. Can you just say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Lord. I want you to realize the goodness of God. I want you to celebrate that this morning. Come on, put your hands together one more time. Worship him. Amen. Amen. Turn around and wave at those around you. Say hi to those. Good grief. All right, yeah, you can smile, show them the pearly whites, and wave at them. Boys and girls can go to children's church at this time, and uh, we just uh, want you to be able to uh, worship today, all right? Just make this time a worship service, and this is what it is. And we are so glad to have you with us today. I want you to just uh, open your hearts and worship with us today and allow the Lord to do in you what He wants to do. How hard is that, right? Are you afraid? Are you afraid to say, God, do in me today what you want to do? Not my will, but your will be done. Hey, right? Uh, there have been some times that that has been said through the Bible that interesting things happen, right? So who knows what the Lord wants to do in your life here this morning. And I believe that God's got a plan. Hey, will you do me a favor? Will you look at in the pocket just in front of you? And there should be a connect card. If you'll complete this Connect card for us, the ushers will be coming by shortly, and you can drop this in the bag then, or if you don't have it finished by the time they come around, around, they'll be standing at the door on your way out, and you can drop it in the bag then. This is a, uh, a great place to put your prayer needs, because this afternoon, our prayer team will come alongside of you uplifting you, praying with you about your particular needs. You don't have to put your name on it if you don't want to, or you can fill out a separate one uh, without a name on it. But uh, use this card because throughout this week, our prayer team is going to be holding you up, praying with you and for you. And uh, we want God to do in your life that, that, that you need him to do. Amen. And we believe that he is. And I was, I was listening to Caitlin sing about he's able to heal our bodies. He's able to raise the dead. And we believe that, right? Okay. I hope the rest of you do before the service is over, right? Okay. All right. Use these cards, though. Also, the offering envelope is there. And uh, all of those in the pocket right in front of you. And let me get my stuff together here. If you're watching online, Loki is sharing with you the link that you need for uh, the online connect card. Also, the online giving, all of that information is there. 
And um, I'm just going to, without spending a lot of time announcing, I just want to say that this coming Thursday, Friday, Saturday is our MC3. And uh, what this is, is three days, my commitment, my church, and my community. So on Thursday, we're fasting and praying for, for ourselves, all right? Renewing our commitment to the Lord, and we ask that you come along and do that with us. Then on Friday, we're fasting and praying for the church, for the ministry uh, here at Life Church. And uh, then on Saturday morning, we're fasting and praying for uh, our community, our city, our county, our country. Uh, we're praying for it all on Saturday. And we're meeting here in the sanctuary at 9 o'clock. We're joining uh, live with Church of the Highlands out of Birmingham, and we're going through the prayer meeting with them. It lasts about an hour, a little more perhaps, but I want to invite you to come on and be a part of that with us Saturday morning. It's a great way to get your Saturday started, and the fact that it is almost 24 hours before we begin service here at Life Church, that we're here in this house praying that God will move in our morning services here at Life Church. I'd love for you to come and take part in that, investing in our Sunday morning services by spending time on Saturday morning praying with us and believing God to do something awesome. Amen. Next Sunday is Belize is uh, I'm sorry, Children's Cup Sunday, and uh, we are going to have this. Uh, next Sunday is the Fourth of July, right? You did. You have looked at the calendar, right? So the 4th of July, next Sunday, and I'm going to tell you, in a time that we live, when it seems that everything is being threatened, I think celebrating our independence in the, the house of God on a Sunday morning when we come together, I think it is a fantastic idea. So yes, we will be having church, and I believe we're going to be having church next Sunday morning, all right? celebrating our freedom. You can do the barbecue afterwards, but come on uh, for service on Sunday morning, 8.30 and 10.30, so you can choose your service, come on, and uh, then you can do the barbecue in the other part of the service, okay? When we're worshiping in the second service, you can be doing barbecue if you want to do that. Uh, but I want to remind you, though, that we will be doing the Children's Cup, so if you don't have your little white cups, if you want to get them before you go, then you can see them over at the check-in counter, I believe. They've got the little white cups. You can bring your nickels, dimes, quarters, pennies, whatever. Uh, and all of those funds that we take up on the first Sunday of the month goes to provide Christmas parties for the children in Belize. And it's not just a party, but it is a witnessing opportunity to children in Belize, and not only children, but also their families. And we do this every year. So we hope to have two or more parties with the children in Belize this coming uh, winter, December, November, December. And we're also doing backpacks for Belize. The children uh, in Belize will not be able to go to school if they don't have the backpacks and the supplies that they need. So we're uh, doing a push for bags for Belize. And uh, I mentioned this in the first service this morning, and I said that we've got a little more than $2,000 already on the bags for Belize, which is going to be at $25 a bag. That's going to be a little more than 80 bags, right? And a lady walked by me on the way out and said, how much do you need for the bags for Belize? And I said, actually, we've got a goal of $12,000. And she looked at me and said, well, I don't have $12,000. But she gave me a check for $2,000. So now we have, come on, you can do better than that, right? So now we have more than $4,000, which is more than 80 bags that we've already got. We need 500, a little more than 500 bags for all of the kids in Belize that are in our care points. So... Uh, uh, this is a miracle that's beginning to happen right here, right now, and I'm so excited. And Wednesday night, we had a guy uh, send in $100, doesn't even go to church here, send in $100 in cash for bags in Belize. That's for backpacks. That's exciting to me, and I'm, I'm sorry, and I, I have said many, many times, I will never ask for a dime for myself, 
Uh, but I will beg you to your bottom dollar for missions, amen, because I believe it's just that important. So we're going to ask our ushers if they will come. We're going to see, receive the morning tithe and offerings and give you an opportunity to give. If you want to give to Bags Before Belize, you can just write it uh, on your check. Or if you're online and you want to do that, you can go to um, Children's Cup. I believe it's Children's Ministries and Children's Cup. And uh, all of the money there will go to the Bags for Belize. But let's bow our heads and let's ask God's blessings on this. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just want to thank you for what you've done. You've blessed us this week. You've provided for us, and we lack nothing today because of you. Lord, we have everything we need. You're our God. You take care of us. Lord, I thank you for the miracle that's coming together with the bags for Belize. I thank you for every miracle that you perform financially for this church and for this missions program. I just want to say thank you. I pray now that you would bless in this offer. Those who have to give, I pray that you would bless them. Those who do not have to give today, I pray that you would bless them with a job that they can too take part in the principles of giving that you put forth in your word. I pray that you will take this offering and you will use it and you will multiply it for the upbuilding of the kingdom of God here in this church, but not only here, but throughout our city, throughout our county, our state, God, even to the far ends of this earth. I pray that you would bless it and use it and bless the remaining part of the service today and let each of us leave this house knowing that we've been in your presence today, in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Normally, every month, uh, several weeks in advance, Loki knows what I'm going to be preaching. Loki's our church secretary and does an awesome job, and she knows what I'm going to be preaching. Well, since I got back from Belize, there's been several sermons that I was going to be preaching that was not necessarily in a series, and so Loki's been having to ask me every week, what you preaching, what you preaching? So, uh, and, and I try to let her know as early as I possibly can on the exact title, and she likes to work the bulletin and, and all of this kind of stuff to make it kind of go with a sermon. But I sent her the title for this week's sermon, and I knew she was going to struggle with it. So I'm preaching this morning on three sickening scenarios. And uh, when you get with a program here and see what we're preaching, you will understand why. But if you are doing the sermon notes, and I hope that you, uh, hope that you are, uh, I will apologize because this morning as I was cutting them, I realized that we had the wrong date. We're actually two weeks behind, so there's been two weeks that you've had the same date on the sermon notes, and I don't know if you've noticed that or not, and I, I, I hope you have used the sermon notes, but uh, today is actually the 27th of June instead of the 13th. But three sickening scenarios. We're going to the book of 2 Peter, chapter 2. And uh, some of you may, be, may have weak stomachs. And uh, don't leave, because I promise we won't tarry that long on this. But um, there's some sickening things that I believe God wants us to know about today, apparently because it's in his word. Second uh, Peter chapter 2, verse 20, the apostle Peter is writing here and says, And when people escape from the wickedness of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and then get tangled up and enslaved by sin again, 
they are worse off than before. So, look at that closely and let that soak in. When people escape from the wickedness of the world by knowing our Lord Jesus Christ and then get tangled up and enslaved by sin again, they are worse off than before. It would be better, verse 21, it would be better if they had never known the way to righteousness than to know it and then reject the command that they were given to live a holy life. We'll look at some of these verses more closely here in a moment, but verse 22 says, and they prove the truth of this proverb, a dog returns to its vomit, and another says, a washed pig returns to the mud. Three sickening scenarios, and the first of which we will look at is a dog's life. How many has a dog? How many has dogs, right? Plural. We're blessed with them at our house. We've got two. Love our dogs. I like our dogs, okay? Carol and I, the other day, were, were laughing because she says that I claim the dog when he does something good, and when he does something bad, it's her dog. And uh, that, that is the case with that 70-something pound English bulldog, and usually it's her dog. Occasionally, he's mine. The Cocker Spaniel, who never gives us any trouble, is, is my dog. But we have dogs. Our dogs, uh, in, in this day and hour that we're living, in modern day, with people with dogs as pets, we don't fully understand exactly this scripture because... Our little dogs are like a child, right? I know there are people in our congregation who have dogs, and you treat them like children. In biblical days, it's a little different, okay? Because they didn't treat them quite the same way as we treat our dogs today. So what Peter is actually saying when he's talking about dogs here in the proverb, he is pulling this from Proverbs chapter 26, verse 11. And I want you to look at that closely with me. He said, as a dog returns to his vomit, and that's one of the sickening scenarios, so a foolish or a fool repeats his foolishness. As a dog returns, so a fool repeats his foolishness. We need to recall, though, in reading this, that dogs were unclean animals for the Jews. They looked at dogs as, well, dogs. Dogs often roamed in packs, scavenged from garbage, and were definitely not considered lovely pets. You may remember a story in the Bible about Lazarus, not the one Jesus raised from the dead, but the one who has sores all over his body. The Bible says that the Dogs licked his sores, and uh, it would be bad to not be able to even make the dogs move along, or it would be even worse to know that it actually made you feel better when the sores were aching you so that a dog was licking your sores. But this is some of what we know about dogs in Scripture. But the point of the proverb is easy to see that dogs return to what is disgusting. Now, when you travel in some of the foreign countries like we've seen in Belize uh, just a few weeks ago, I saw in Belize and, and even in Honduras and in Africa how the, the dogs are basically scavengers just like the vultures, right? They're just waiting on something else to die or, or something to, to be weak, so weak that they can't outrun them because that is their next meal. And this is how a lot of dogs lived. And perhaps even the same way in these days, the biblical days, but that dog returning to his vomit is sickening. But there's a reason that story is there. The next life I want us to look at is the pig's life. How many of you have raised pigs before? 
You know what it's like to have, I don't mean a pet pig, and I know some of you have had a pet pig uh, the first time I ever met one of these families that I will not call their name, but I'm pointing in their direction. But the first time I ever met them, she had a pig wrapped up in a blanket sitting in a chair at Dumont, not Dumont Plaza, at, at one of the, the farmer's marketplace downtown and uh, loves pigs, and I believe still got the pig. I like pigs, too. I usually like them fried. Uh, I usually like them barbecued. Okay, that's the way I usually. But a pig's life, why would that even come up in the Scripture? Second Peter 2, 22, they prove the truth of the proverb, a dog returns to his vomit, and another says a washed pig returns to the mud. When that pig gets washed, does he go to the mud as soon as he can? Mm -hmm. uh, I knew he did. Uh, that's the way pigs are, right? Again, that's the way pigs are. Pigs love the mud. And I remember when I was a child, dad pastored a church uh, down the road a ways. And there was a man in our church that had a, what he called a hog parlor. And that's not the same thing as a beauty parlor, but it's a hog parlor. And there would be big pens with concrete slab, and uh, the, there would be 50 or 100 pigs or hogs inside of this pen. Down at the bottom of it, the, there would be a slant in the foundation, and down at the bottom of it would be a, a, a muddy place that the pigs would hang out. I mean, it had everything you could imagine in. It was, it was filthy, but those pigs, you could take the water hose and you could wash them down, you know, as, as they are washing. And I haven't did that a time or two. But take the water hose and, and wash the, the, the mire down to the bottom of the thing. And the pigs, you know, just washing them off. And they just love it as you're just spraying them down. And then they turn right around and go waller in the stuff you washed off of them. Why is that even in the Bible? Pigs were also unclean animals for the Jews. They were not uh, even to get near the, Jew, the, the, uh, the pigs. And you can imagine Peter, the same guy who wrote this, by the way, Peter resting when all of a sudden there's a vision or dream of a, a sheet that comes down from heaven and, and it's got all kind of piggy things in it and, and unclean animals and something says to him, rise, kill, and eat. And Peter's like, whoa, no, I've never done anything like that. I will never do that. God had a lesson for him and that's another sermon. But pigs were nasty. But somehow or another, they've made it into the scripture. The dogs returning to vomit, the pigs returning to their mud so we've got the pig's life, we've got the dog's life, then we've got the backslider's life. And it gets quiet. Similar to the dog's life and the pig's life, those who have renounced the Christian faith, either by their statements or by their lifestyle. They've returned to what is disgusting, Finding it more attractive than the way of righteousness and the sacred commandments. You didn't know today that we were going to be likening people to pigs and dogs this morning, did you? But when one decides to walk away from that that they have known to be so powerful and so pure, back to their former lifestyle... It is as a pig going back to their mud or a dog going back to their vomit. Second Peter 2.20, let's look at these verses again and look closely. When people escape from the wickedness of this world by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that's how we come to know Christ and find forgiveness of our sins. And that's how we find deliverance and being set free from, from the chains of addiction, from the chains of destruction. We find that through Jesus Christ and then get tangled up. I want you to look at these words closely here. The first line, it says, when people escape, look at that word escape. 
and then look down on the fourth line, and we find the word tangled. Have you ever seen a, a creature of some sort that is tangled up in something, and you go and even maybe risk your life to set that thing free when all of a sudden you let them go and they go right back into the same mess they were in. Have you ever seen that? We find escape, we find tangle, we find enslaved. We were free and then we go right back to get in that tangle mess, that enslavement that has all been brought about by sin. Three sickening scenarios, the dog, the pig, and us, as we go back to those things that God sets us free from. Why do we do that? Why do we do it? I've looked at my dogs sometimes, or Carol's dogs, and I've, I've said, why did you do that? You know, some of the things that they would eat. Why do you do that? And I wonder sometimes if God doesn't look at us in the same way. Why? Why do we find freedom from entanglement and freedom in Jesus Christ only to go right back into that mess that we were in? And the latter part of this verse says they are worse off than before. Let me tell you, the things that God has set you free from, the things that God has delivered you from, if you go back into those things, you know by now, some of us already know, that when we go back in those things, getting out the second time is much more difficult because we have figured it out. Grace. Two weeks ago, I preached about standing in grace. Last week, I preached about repenting in the Father, God looking at us as one who's been forgiven and not even bringing up our sins anymore. But what about us that we just want to keep going back and getting into the same entanglement? Peter says you're worse off than before. You're worse off. And look where he says, he goes so far as to say in verse 21, it would be better if they had never known the way to righteousness than to know it and then reject the command that they were given to live a holy life. Wow. What do you think about that? This is Peter's writing. Peter's the one that preached on the day of Pentecost where all the people got saved. Remember, Peter's now writing this to us. Apparently, he had experienced some backsliders. So apparently, he had experienced something similar himself. Perhaps. But it would be better if they had never known the way to righteousness. It would have been better for you to have never heard that there was a church that there was a preacher, that there was a sermon, that there was an altar call, that there was a song saying, and that, that the Holy Spirit got a hold of your heart with, and you came to the altar and gave your life to the Lord and determined that you was going to live for God. You may have even signed a membership card. You may have even been a part of it. But return to that, Peter says it would have been better that they never known the way to righteousness. Than to know it and then reject the command that they were given to live a holy life. I want to carry you and let's look at some of the words of Christ. And I want you to look at what he says. He gives an interesting scenario here in Matthew chapter 12, verse 43. <clears throat> Jesus says that when an evil spirit leaves a person and when we come to Christ and we give our life to Christ, we know that he sets us free, right? All things are uh, done away with. We are new in Christ. We have 
victory over evil spirits. When an evil spirit leaves a person, it goes into the desert seeking rest but finding none. I think it's interesting, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, using this story about an evil spirit. Verse 44, then it says, the spirit, I will return to the person I came from. How many knows that once you give your life to Christ and you've asked God to forgive you of your sins and you are a believer now, how many knows that he's going back to try to get you back, right? Do I have the right crowd this morning? You do know that the, the tempter comes back, right? But this spirit goes and checks out the place he was once living and returns and finds that the former home is swept and in order. You're looking at the words, aren't you? Swept in in order, cleaned up, but empty. You saw that, didn't you? There's a whole other sermon there, but we're not going to spend a lot of time there today. But the Spirit has found the house empty, swept up in order. And the Spirit finds seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they all enter the person and live there. Why? Because the place was empty. We don't have time to go there today, but when the sins are gone, you need to fill your life up with something, and I believe that is with church, with the Word of God, with prayer time, a prayer life. There's so many things, godly, you can fill that time with, fill that space with. But the Spirit brought back seven more spirits, more evil than itself, and they all enter the person and live there. And so that person is worse off than before. Where have we heard that before? Isn't that what we heard, Peter? That said that it would be better for you never to have even heard the gospel than to have heard and now gone back. There's a lot of things today trying to get people to go back. There's a lot of people, there's a lot of things today trying to get people to change your belief, change your way, change your understanding of what the Word of God says, right? But if you choose to go back, it's going to be worse than before. And then Jesus drops this interesting line, that will be the experience of this evil generation. It will have been better for them to have never heard about Jesus Christ coming to earth than for them to have heard and returned. And now that that had been clean, they had been cleaned from, has come back and now they are seven times worse than before. I find that interesting. I want us to go to the pen of the Apostle Paul and let's see some of the things that Paul said along these same lines. Galatians chapter 1 and verse 6, Paul says, I'm shocked. I'm shocked that you are turning away so soon from God who called you to himself through the loving mercy of Christ. You are following a different way that pretends to be the good news. Have you heard the good news? I mean, the better news that they're putting out there than this news? Have you heard that? I mean, there, there's lots of news out there. And they tell you that this is not needed anymore, right? Because they say this is archaic. It is so old. I read this past week that there is a group that's rising that is trying to discredit the Apostle Paul altogether. To completely discredit him and block him out. You know why? Because he speaks against sexual sins. For, for the main reason. There are things out there trying to tell us, 
today that what we thought was wrong is really not wrong. Or what we thought the Bible was saying is really not what the Bible is saying, but in other words, we've learned better. Have you heard that? Look again at the scripture. Paul says, I'm shocked that you are turning away so soon from God who called you to himself through the loving mercy of Christ. You're following a different way that pretends to be the good news. Be careful in what you follow. Because you could be backsliding without even realizing it. Walking away from God. 1 Timothy 5.15, Paul says, I am afraid that some of them have already gone astray and is now following Satan. How is someone going to follow Satan? There's not a one of us, there's not a one in this world. Changing that, there, are a, there is a slight few that I shun from, but that would follow what we know of a, as a devil with horns and a pitchfork and a forked tail and red. There's not many folks going to go running after him, Right? That's why he does far more damage as an angel of light than he does as one toting a pitchfork or even as a roaring lion. He does a lot more damage coming across as the right way. Something appealing, something attractive, something that will just make you say, ah, and how could I have missed that? But Paul says that you're following Satan. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, and some people craving money have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. Money is what talks today, right? Money's what talks. We could spend a while there, but we'll go to 1 Timothy 6.20. Paul says to Timothy, guard what God has entrusted to you. Avoid godless, foolish discussions with those who oppose you with their so-called knowledge. Timothy, in other words, you're a young man who has been born into the faith. Your grandmother is a believer. Your mom is a believer. You have been born in the faith. You have experienced the power of God, the transforming power of Jesus Christ. You are learning the word. You are being a good soldier, being a good believer. But guard what God has entrusted to you. Why would we need to guard it? We could get so deep in theology this morning that we would all drown before we left. But let's, let's look at this just closely here. Why would you need to guard what God has entrusted to you? Why avoid godless, foolish discussions with those who oppose you with their so-called knowledge? Isn't it interesting how some people try to get you to believe what they believe because they just come across as so smart. They know it all. But how does it match up with the Word of God? How does it match up with the book? Let me say this again. We're trying to get you in the Word. We are on several years now going through the one-year Bible because we want you to know what it says. We want you to understand and we want you to believe. We teach the Word. We preach the Word to our children, to our, to our adults, because we want you to know the Word. 
And we want you to guard that that God has given you. So I'm going to tell you what. You have to be a sinner to ever fully appreciate forgiveness. And then you need to guard this that God has entrusted to you. The Spirit of God living in your life. The holy calling on your life. You need to guard that. And he says do that by avoiding godless, foolish discussions with those who oppose you with their so-called knowledge. I just find it amazing how this book has made it through so many generations, so many thousands of years, and go back and look at some of the Dead Sea Scrolls, if you could read Hebrew, or trust someone who has, and see how it is matched up with the word that has been carried for generation to generation to generation, and even here where we are today. I tell you what, I, I love my word. I love my, I say my word, my Bible. I love this because I believe it's God's word, and I believe it is alive, and I believe that I need to live by it, but not only that, but I believe that I need to understand that I will be judged by it. Go over to the book of Revelation and you find there is another book that's open. Who knows? But it could possibly this be this book. Foolish discussions with those who oppose you with their so-called knowledge. What are they trying to do? They're trying to get you to backslide. Worse than a pig wallowing in the mud. Worse than a dog returning to its vomit is one who once was a believer, a follower of Christ, going back to the life that they knew prior to Christ. The next verse, 21, some people have wandered from the faith by following such foolishness. May God's grace be with you all. 2 Timothy 4.10, Paul tells of one, Demas has deserted me because he loved the things of this life. I don't know where you are this morning in your walk with the Lord, but I'm very concerned today about our Christian walk. You are, we are, to be growing in Christ. We are to be becoming stronger in Christ daily by spending time in His Word, by spending time in prayer, by spending time with other believers in perhaps small groups or in fellowship time, or in church worship time. We are to be doing this because these things help us to grow. Not only that, through prayer and fasting, these things help us to grow to maturity. Paul, I believe it was Paul said in another place that some of you ought to be teachers now, but you're still sucking a bottle. We keep doing the same works over and over again. We... We get saved, and then we go back and do the same thing that we did before, and we repent, and we get back and go back and do the same thing, and it's just over and over and over and over. Isn't there supposed to be a growing out of that? Maturity. Growing to the, sticking to that that we know, relying on the Holy Spirit. But you said, Pastor... You, you've told us before that if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all righteousness. Yes, but that doesn't mean that we can go sin all week long just so we can get to come back Sunday morning and, and repent again. Be careful with your walk. Be careful with your journey. Be careful. Because the latter state is worse than before. And, and to see in the Bible where it says that you would be better off to have never heard this. 
than to hear it and then to deny. One of the saddest things there is for me to see is people who have once preached the gospel of Jesus Christ only to now say that there's nothing to it. I will be honest with you, there are days that we all go through things that make us wonder, God, are you really there? Can you hear me? Do you care? And he does, and he is. But to deny the faith, whether by statement or by actions, it's more sickening than a dog returning to its vomit or a pig returning to its waller. The young boy just kind of got tired of living at home and went and asked his dad for his money. And the dad chucked out a bunch of money, gave it to the boy. The boy left home. He was happy. He was free. He had friends. He was very popular. You know, when you have money, you become very popular. But he became very popular. He had everything. Living it up away from dad. You can imagine how that is. Living up, living life to the fullest and pretty soon the checking account was empty and pretty soon his pocketbook was empty and credit cards were being declined. Pretty soon the friends were gone, every one of them had vanished. He was homeless, jobless, dollarless. And he started looking for work. And he found a place at a, of all places, a pig farm. And he got a job feeding pigs. And he was so hungry that he even looked at what he was feeding the pigs. He would have starved had he not had that. How could that be? Then he began to think about dad's house. Dad's got a big establishment and he's got people that work there for him that has it better than I've got it. So he decided he was going to go back home. He started on his journey back home, wondering what it's going to be like. After a long walk, he comes to the end of the lane, and as he's coming around the corner, coming down the lane, he sees his dad. And his dad breaks and runs. And stinking son, filthy. His dad grabs him, embraces him, kisses him, and he yells out to the workers, my son who was lost has now been found, he's home, he's back, kill the fatted calf, bring out the ring, Get him a shower, put a robe on him. 
Jesus told that story. So interesting of how the prodigal went so far away. But Jesus didn't leave him in the pig pen. In the story, he brought him back. And the kiss of the father. I was just a very young preacher. And I was asked to preach once and I, one night and I prayed and sought God. And God burnt this on my heart so heavily about the next prodigal making it back home in time. I'll never forget that. The prodigal represents a backslider. Someone who wanders from the Father because it just looks better out there. But he also rep represents the backslider coming back to God and being met with a hug, a kiss, an embrace. I want you to listen to me. I don't know where you stand this morning. You may be that backslider. You may be that one that has once known what it was like to feel the presence of God. To know what it was like to be free of your sin. No more guilt. No more remorse. And to be walking in love with Christ. But today you may find yourself in a sloppy situation. The Father's waiting. Three sickening scenarios. And the greatest of those is the backslider away from the Father. I want you to stand with me. Holy Spirit, I'm asking you to move in your own way. Holy Spirit. What kind of life are you living now? What is the scenario that you're living out? I don't know what it would have been like if the prodigal hadn't have made it home. I don't know. If you're a backslider, I don't know what it'll be like if you don't come back to God. But I know that His Word said it would have been better had you never known. I want to open the altar. I want to invite you to come. This is your time. This is your opportunity. Don't leave this place today. Don't walk away in a backslidden condition. The Father's waiting. You can, with just a little bit of faith and a little bit of effort, you can turn this into a victory for you. God can turn this around for you this morning. You don't have to leave a backslider. You can leave victorious in Christ. The altar is open. Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost. No weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't prevail. 
Cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph. Oh, my God will never fail. Oh, my God will never fail. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory for the There's not one of us today that are exempt from the attacks of the enemy and trying to pull us back. And don't ever think that you've arrived because none of us are wearing crowns. None of us. But if I were you, I would spend a little more time this week searching my heart, searching my mind, searching my life. Spend time in the Word. Spend time praying. And listen, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, collectively as a group, in our separate places, but yet collectively fasting, praying, and seeking God for ourselves, our church, our community.
There's a big force of deception moving through this country. Don't get caught up in it. Prepare yourselves. Strengthen yourselves. Let's grow to maturity, all right, in Christ. God bless you. Love you to death. Uh, I want to pray with you before you go. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you. I pray, Lord, that you will go with us as we go our way. Every person in this place as they go, Holy Spirit, I pray that you will just guide and direct them, that you would speak to them your word again tonight, tomorrow, throughout the week. I pray, Lord, that you would draw us each closer to you, that we would become more and more mature in you. And God, I pray that you would help us to bring others with us on this journey in the kingdom. I pray, God, that you will go with us now. Keep your hands on us. Be with us till we come back here again. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. In Jesus' name.